A black kite looks for prey in the dry ranch country of central Spain. usually scavenge and hunt on dry land, but in the heart of Spain, the water often harbors much of their prey. It also conceals some of the area's most sinister predators. But regardless of what eats what, all these creatures face a common threat. The pools can disappear. This region of central Spain is an ancient Mediterranean landscape of rolling plains and evergreen oaks. The Spanish call it Deesa. The trees are vital to the area. They help to retain moisture in the gasping summer heat. The ESO agriculture is basic. The bark is stripped from the cork oaks every seven years to make corks for wine bottles. This doesn't damage the trees, which are hundreds of years old. The system has worked well for centuries, but now some areas are threatened by more intensive farming and pollution. With a million hectares of trees cut down, the soil is eroding and the water table is falling. In the hot months, livestock must leave the Deesa for the cooler sanctuary of the high mountains. In the dry fierceness of the summer, the seasonal pools and streams on the plains are reduced to dust and rocks. It's hard to conceive of anything living here, but a unique assortment of animals has adapted to these conditions. Some of them survive buried below the surface until the first November rain clouds form. Then they call. A male midwife toad has dug his way up to the surface and attracted a mate. Now clasping her round the waist, he rubs his toes against her belly so that she releases eggs. The toads are the size of a coat button and they break several amphibian rules. They mate on dry land, for one thing. This gives them a head start over others, which have to wait for the pools to form, and that won't happen for a couple of weeks. Then, when he's fertilized the eggs, the male midwife wraps them round his ankles. It's very rare in nature for the male to leave holding the babies. He may attract and mate with several females. When he's gathered a good batch of eggs, he'll take them underground to escape the heat and wait for the streams to form. courses come to life again and where they flow into the flatter areas of this rolling country they spill out to form great pools. Overnight these fill with hundreds of different amphibians drawn from the surrounding countryside. While the common toads are busy fattening themselves up to breed the small midwife males are breaking out of their burrows. The 
the midwives are at least a fortnight in front of everyone else. And when they're sure that this is no flash flood and the pools are here to stay, they leap down to the water. The males can feel the tadpoles are wriggling to get out. They hatch almost at once. Then the midwife leaves them to their own devices. They're already large when they hatch and need to grow fast before the predatory newts arrive. The midwife toad has just one short journey to the water and back again, but those creatures that stay near the pond to mate have to prolong their stay in this danger zone. A spadefoot toad has been surprised by a water snake. Most toads have poisoned glands to deter predators, but the spadefoot's venom is not very effective and its main defense is to inflate its body with air. But the snake can get round this by dislocating its jaw. Also, left and right sides of the mouth can work independently, slowly but surely enveloping the prey. Close by in the pool, a group of male spadefoot toads compete for a spawning female. The competition is intense. The spadefoot's strategy is to produce many eggs. This string contains perhaps 3,000 and is simply left where it's laid. There's no parental care. The eggs must develop fast if they're to change into toads before everything dries out again. There are masses of mating amphibians here, including a primitive species called the sharp-ribbed salamander, which is unique to Spain and Portugal. In order to mate, the male comes up below the female and tries to hook his front feet around hers. Then he turns his belly up towards her and fertilizes her. Occasionally, they need a breather. In places on the Deessa, the watercourses have been dammed to save every last drop of autumn rain. The Romans were the first to do this when they occupied this area 2,000 years ago. They also stocked the dams with carp and perch, and their descendants are still here, attracting fishing birds like these black storks. Grey herons come here from all over Europe to fish in these pools and escape the northern winter. Black storks must be among the most beautiful of all fishing birds. This is the only place in Europe where they live permanently, and there may be no more than 80 birds altogether. Their close relatives, the white storks, are much more common because they seem to tolerate people. But the black storks are shy and seemingly unable to get on with 20th century man. They stir up the water with their bills and feet until they see or feel a fish.
European cranes come from as far away as Sweden to feed on the Deessa and its crop of acorns. After Christmas, the landscape is green and bright with the yellow flowering broom. Water crowfoot carpets the surface of the slow flowing streams. It's now the marbled newts are drawn to the water. The males appear first. They develop a crest on their backs during the breeding season, while the females are more rounded and ripe with eggs. Newts spend most of their lives on land and are air breathers. The male takes a large gulp before he embarks on his courtship, which is more sophisticated than the rough and tumble of the sharp-ribbed salamanders. First, he fans her with his tail. This sends a current of his chemical sense called pheromones. Later, he'll pass his sperm to her. When she moves towards him, he knows she's receptive. Now he gets her to follow him and pick up sperm that he leaves in front of her. The spermatophore, as it's called, is almost invisible in the weed, but she'll take it on board and be fertilized. He pushes her back with his tail as part of the ceremony. A day later, she'll begin to smell leaves to see which one is suitable for her eggs. She wraps each egg up in a leaf to protect it. She'll wrap 130 eggs altogether. Towards the end of winter, a new sound floats up from the streams and pools at sunset. In March, the tree frogs come down to the water to breed. This particular frog occurs in the Canaries, the south of France, and Morocco. It's called the stripeless tree frog, a confusing name as it does actually have short stripes. There are Peretzi's frogs here too. The males fight each other in between calling for mates. They have two vocal sacs and quite complex calls. In the stripeless tree frogs, the male is smaller than the female, and once he has attracted her, he climbs on her back. This is the moment of fertilization. Then she lays the eggs, two at a time, on the stems of water plants. By May, the watercourses are warming up, and now that the amphibians have spawned, it's time for several of them to leave. The marbled newts will continue their land-based existence until the heat drives them into summer dormancy. 
In the meantime, below the surface, the tadpoles start their hazardous passage to adulthood. The midwife toads tadpoles were the first into the water and are a good size now. But the spadefoots are doing well too. They hatch later, but grow faster, so the two are roughly the same size at this stage. Spadefoot tadpoles feed off weed initially with their tough black teeth, but later they become omnivorous. The salamander tadpoles are about three millimeters long. They miss out the vegetarian stage and eat tiny animals like water fleas. The feathery gills are for breathing underwater and for moving themselves about. In mid-May, there's plenty for everyone to eat on the Deessa, and showers of spring rain are on the way, which will temporarily replenish the streams. At the end of the afternoon, the tree frogs come out to gorge themselves on the flies along the stream banks. Another waterside feeder is the azure-winged magpie. They're not a local species. They were probably brought back and released here several centuries ago by sea captains who found them in China. They're very adaptable and can catch and eat small fish. These striped-necked terrapins are warming up before returning to the pond to feed on tadpoles. Their speed depends on their body temperature and they slow down as they get colder. The European terrapin is both a scavenger and a hunter. It will have a go at catching most types of tadpole and even small fish, although it's not always successful. It's a tadpole hiding among the rocks that finally falls victim. Terrapins have very powerful jaws and tear their prey apart, but things are not always straightforward when you're trapped in a shell like this. The tadpole's most sinister enemy hunts in another part of the pool. The snake hunts its prey mainly by scent. 
It's not a very efficient hunter either. On average, only one in 62 strikes is successful. But at this time of year, there's a lot to strike at. Water snakes prefer soft-bodied tadpoles to fish, and many a tadpole meets its end in these jaws. Amphibians lay many eggs and can afford to lose a proportion of their young. The tadpoles grow fast. Enough make it through the minefield of predators and out onto dry land. But they've all got to leave soon. The pools are about to vanish. Magpies pick around for scraps. The water is going fast, evaporating in the midsummer heat. Dragonflies lay their eggs, which are programmed to hatch next season. Only a few of the pool's inhabitants will remain in what will soon be a dusty bed of pebbles. In one of the last pools, a solitary terrapin takes a final look around. Any day now, it will have to find a burrow on dry land in which to pass the long, parching summer. The magpies can search elsewhere for food. The only creature visible along the dried out stream beds and pools is a mantis whose prayer for rain will not be answered for three long months when a distant roll of thunder will announce that the pools will fill again. The last of the series next week profiles half goat, half antelope, the chamois, better known as the cloth for cleaning your car windscreen. That's on Monday at 8.30.